Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone to Digging In. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. And Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time through November for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at the pbd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function on the side of your Zoom screen. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will give our speaker time to answer as many as they can with the understanding that we might not get to all of them. And today we are very excited to have Dr. Christina Douglas joining us all the way from Pennsylvania. In addition to being a Phillips Academy graduate class of 2002, Dr. Douglas is an assistant professor of anthropology at Penn State University. So welcome Dr. Douglas and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can get started. Just let me know if for any reason you can't see the screen. Hopefully that's come through. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to be here today and, and thank you, Lindsay, for this wonderful invitation. The topic today is about inclusive approaches to archaeological work, um, specifically on Madagascar, which is where I've been working now for the past 10 years or so. This topic, I think, is really timely at the moment because as we look at the crises all around us uh, in different ways, we see how inequality is really affecting um, people's lives. Um, again, in many, many different aspects of, of life. And I think that this issue of inequality really intersects with archaeological practice. The kind of research that I do has a lot to do with environmental questions, and I will share some of those with you in just a moment. But I want to start by telling you a story, Try to, trying to get you situated in the day-to-day -day work that we do in Madagascar. So a few years ago, in the field, I wake up, it's 6 a.m. I wake up with a start because I realize all of a sudden that I'm late for rehearsal, dance rehearsal. So I jump up, I jump out of bed as much as a pregnant lady can jump out of anything. I was pregnant with my first son at the time and get dressed really quickly in the dark because we don't have electricity uh, in our, our, our field camp, um, get dressed, run outside, and see that the whole team, 25 people, are looking up at my balcony waiting for me. Everybody was already ready to get started with the day's rehearsal. And so I, I run down the stairs and we start rehearsing a hip hop choreography that I was able to share with the team um, from a hip hop teacher that I study with here in State College, PA. And we practiced for about an hour or so, and then everybody you know, went, had breakfast, got ready, put on our field clothes, and headed out for a day's worth of excavation. So why, you might ask, were we rehearsing a hip hop choreography um, during a field season for archeological research? Well, we were working on a presentation that we were going to give for the Independence Day celebrations that take place every June 26th um, in communities all over Madagascar. And in our particular region, these celebrations take place in the town of Befandefa. And I'm gonna play this short clip so you see us, um, our team dancing and sort of proceeding in um, uh, to the, the, the central part of, of the town and you'll see community members all around watching us. Um, and you'll also see people bringing money to give us tips as we're dancing, which is a common um, practice to encourage the dancers, the people who are, are, are presenting, and to show the community's appreciation. And so we were one of many groups um, on this day presenting 
dances and, and poetry readings and all kinds of other types of performances to celebrate Independence Day. So let me play this clip for just a moment and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Can you hear the music? Yep. So here you see our team dancing in, processing in. I just want to point out that we're all wearing the team's t-shirt, which features on the back uh, a drawing that I made of the extinct elephant birds of Madagascar. And the t-shirts are designed to get people to ask us questions, which they did after the dance performance, ask us questions about the kind of research that we do. And so the idea is that, you know, by doing this kind of outreach in the community, we can get people excited and interested in the work that we do, but also using dance in this way breaks down a lot of barriers so that people both on the team, but people in the wider community don't feel like they can't approach us. I think the fact that we're willing to put ourselves out there in the community um, makes people laugh, first of all, um, and gets rid of some of those, you know, power dynamics that might otherwise make people um, shy about approaching us. So we do this as a team every year, and we do a combination of local dances, but also then choreographies that come from other cultures. And I happen uh, to love a lot of uh, Afro-Brazilian and, and American dance forms. And so we've, we've shared all of these with the community over the years. So I'm telling you all of this because community collaboration and outreach are really the foundations on which our work in Madagascar um, is built. And so I know you probably all wanted to see the rest of the dance, but I'm gonna move, move ahead in the slides a little bit. And so now I'm gonna explain a little bit more about what I mean by community outreach and community collaboration. And then I'm gonna tell you why I think that matters so much uh, in the case of Madagascar. We work in the Southwest part of Madagascar. Here you see um, a, a box that outlines the research area, and these are the names of some of the sites that we have excavated. Over here, we have some other archeological sites that are really significant in Southwest Madagascar that I won't really talk about today, um, but, but this is a map from a publication in which we described those sites. This region is particularly dry. Um, it's a coastal area, so you have this very nice contrast between the um, coral reef sort of marine ecosystem and then a very dry coastal desert. Um, the picture that you see here was taken with a drone and it shows the village of Andavadok, which is where our research camp, our research lab um, are all based. And so this is really where we call home um, when we're working in Madagascar. There are many different levels at which our team collaborates with communities. So we collaborate with people on an international level. And here I'm showing some examples of performing artists, including musicians um, and filmmakers, but also members of the Malagasy expatriate community. Here we have the former um, uh, representative of Madagascar to the United Nations. Um, and the reason that we have this kind of outreach and collaboration is because we're trying to communicate the results of our research with as broad of an audience as possible and to really get people, not just in the Southwest of Madagascar, but all over the island and beyond to be aware of the um, significance of our findings that I'm gonna tell you about in a few minutes. We also really make an effort to collaborate with people at the national and regional levels. And here in particular, I mean um, scholars or researchers who work in museums, um, in the capital and elsewhere and universities, but also members of uh, government and administration who have an interest in the kinds of environmental questions or climate change questions that we are uh, studying. 
but oftentimes are not necessarily invited by researchers to be present in the field. So we often have um, representatives of different government offices or um, museums come with us to do field work. And we feel that that's a way in which we can really directly share the results of our work and make sure that those, again, get communicated to people far and wide. But I'm especially going to talk about how we collaborate at the very local level. And I showed you a picture of Andavadok, which is where we call home. So the local community is made up of people from fishing groups, um, but also people who have this kind of herding or farming background. It's a mix of people. Oh. <laughs> Someone saying hi. I knew this would probably happen. Hello. Uh, this is Virgil. He has also been in the field um, in utero uh, a couple years ago. Um, so this is directly relevant to him. In fact, this picture may have been taken when, when I was pregnant with Virgil. In any case, so our local yeah. team is made up of a pretty... Ball. ball is essentially the only word that he, he knows at this stage. Um, so everything is a ball, uh, anything. So right now he's looking at an O and he's pointing and saying that the, that's a ball. Um, so the local, the local team is a pretty diverse group of younger people and elders in the community from, again, all these different backgrounds. So there are people on the team who are traditional fishers. Um, there are people on the team who come from families that, that make their living from herding uh, livestock and or farming. And we really try to include all of these different uh, representatives of the community because again this helps us to communicate the results of our research very broadly amongst different um, you know different <laughs> parts of the community. It's also really important to us that we have people of different educational backgrounds and many members of our team have no formal educational background. Um, some members of our team do not have formal literacy skills but we've developed a way of working in which we can make everything that we do accessible um, regardless of educational background. So for example, when we use um, iPads or other kinds of recording devices, okay, we're passing Virgil along. He's been lured away with an Oreo, that always works. Um, we make sure that the ways in which people can record the information uh, is usable by anybody with any, any level of um, literacy or, or language background. So we're really trying to make the research that we do um, accessible. We also have a rule that anybody who works on the team has to learn how to do all of the different kinds of analysis or uh, data collection that we do. This means that everybody learns how to survey, everybody learns how to excavate, everybody learns how to use the technology that we, we use for mapping, whether that's a, a handheld GPS or a total station device, using the devices we use for imaging, so learning how to use a drone, for example. Um, Everybody learns how to analyze archaeological materials, including ceramics or animal bones. This doesn't mean that everybody loves all of these uh, different tasks. Everybody tends to have a preference and an affinity or, or you know, talent for certain things. But it means that as a team of, again, about 25 people, give or take, everybody understands the reason we're collecting certain materials, what those materials might be able to tell us about ancient communities. And that also means that everybody can participate when it comes to asking new questions or interpreting our results. So that's, that's a hard and fast rule um, in our project's uh, work. These are just a couple of quick snapshots of field work, what that looks like. So we often use local um, sailcraft. Here's a, a local um, fishing vessel called a lakana. And here we are, um, the team doing survey, getting between different survey sites 
on the traditional um, ox cart. Um, so these are the local oxen called zebu locally. So we've done survey all over this coastal area and this map over to the right is just showing you the locations of some of the archaeological sites that we've found. And it's significant because many people assume that this region, because it's so dry and relatively inhospitable um, or seems to be inhospitable um, for, for humans because it's so dry and the, the climate is unpredictable, that this area would not have been settled uh, by people, at least not as a sort of preferred settlement location, despite the availability of marine resources too. So what we're finding is that you know, people have lived in this region for the last 3,000 years, and that they have settled um, all, over, all over the coastal uh, zone. We spend a lot of time when we're in the field as a team talking with the broader community. I showed you the clip of us dancing, so that's one way in which we communicate, but we also regularly hold community meetings and we share the results of our research and then open things up for questions and discussion. And so here we are at one of these meetings with the local Fishers Association. And these are always meetings uh, where we get really incisive questions. Um, and these meetings always leave us with food for thought and, and really critical but constructive feedback for how we're designing our research questions. So in addition to reaching out to community um, through the meetings I just described and by having a really diverse team, as I just showed, we really try to incorporate local knowledge into the work that we do. So one aspect of our work um, as archaeologists is to try to understand how people in the past interacted with the plants and animals in their environment. To understand that, we also are interested in how people living in this region today interact with the plants and animals around them. And so what we've done is we've started to document basic information, including how people classify plants and animals in this region. Because in many cases, the way in which they classify a plant or animal as belonging to a particular species or family um, is very different from the way Western scientific um, uh, classifications work. So for example, on the far left and the far right, I'm showing two examples of um, mollusks that belong to different families according to Western scientific, Western Linnaean classification. But in the local uh, classification, these belong to the same family and are a male and female version of one another. So on the left hand, you have what they call buzikilahi, which means the male buziki. And on the right, you have the female buziki, buzikivavi. So we're trying to understand why people classify these plants and animals differently, because that might give us some clues as to how people um, think of these species and how they interact with them. We also make an effort when we're including uh, information from the local community about um, you know, their relationship with the world around them, their environment, uh, to include members of the community who might um, not always have the most, um, uh, have the loudest voice, at least not in, um, a situation like a community meeting where in some cases, you know, men are expected to speak more publicly and, and women um, refrain from speaking publicly. This is not always the case, but what we try to do is to make sure that we um, interact with community members in a variety of different um, 
fora or locations and contexts so that everybody's voice gets heard and, and the knowledge that everybody has can, can be included in our project. We've used local knowledge for some very practical applications. As somebody who studies animal remains as a way to understand how people interacted with animals in the past, we rely or I rely very heavily on comparative collections. In this case, I'm talking specifically about comparative skeleton collections so that I can look at an archeological specimen of a, an animal bone, like a fish bone that comes from, you know, a, a midden or a, a basically old trash. And I can identify that bone to its species. To do that, you need a comparative sample of bones with a known species identification so that you can be sure that what you're looking at really represents that species. Well, for Southwest Madagascar, there are very limited comparative collections available. So one of the things that we've done by working very closely with community members is we've used um, communities expertise and knowledge to build a locally based comparative skeleton collection for marine fauna. And so this is the largest collection that exists now in the Western Indian Ocean for um, marine fauna. We have several hundred uh, specimens already um, and we, we started building this collection just two years ago. So it's, it's a remarkable achievement um, of our community collaboration and people in the community are extremely proud that we have this collection because it should serve as a resource, not just for us, but for many other um, researchers and community members who may have an interest in, um, in questions about uh, these animals. Another very practical um, application or, or approach from our, collabor our collaborations is that we're documenting oral histories in this region systematically. So there are many elders in the community who can share with us information about um, the different communities' histories, where people have moved to or settled, um, how the environment has changed over time, um, there are many, many, many kinds of, of information that we can get from oral histories. And so what we do now is systematically in, in all of the communities in the wider region, and so far for us, this includes 36 different villages. Um, we interview when possible elders in the community, and we do that um, by you know, voice recording the stories that they can tell. Um, but we've also used some Kind of innovative approaches. So here um, is a, an elder named Remisi wearing a, a set of um, goggles that allow him to see the live feed from our drone. So the drone is flying above an archaeological site and the landscape and Remisi is, is looking through the goggles and seeing the live you know images coming from the drone and he's telling us about that, the landscape from that aerial perspective. So we've done a lot of things um, to, to try to, um, you know, in some ways access people's memories and invite them to share stories about this landscape that we record. And this is important because many people in the community have said that the the histories that the elders um, have are starting to disappear you know, as people pass away um, or as people's um, lives change because there's more sort of globalizing uh, effects in their community, that these stories are being lost. So in and of itself, this archive um, has, has a lot of value and we, we provide digital recordings um, on SD cards to community members. Another um, aspect of collaboration um, that I think is really important to mention because uh, this may be one that doesn't, um, you know, 
that, that doesn't immediately come to mind for a lot of folks is that we collaborate not only with living members of local communities, but we also collaborate with ancestors. And the way that we do this is oftentimes through um, local traditions uh, where people are honoring the ancestors and consulting with them on specific questions. And this often involves the sacrifice of important animals like oxen, zebu, um, and then a very ceremonial and traditional sharing of the meat with um, different members of the community, different clans who are represented. And this is a way locally in which people communicate with their ancestors and ask them either for blessings or guidance. And so we do this on a regular basis and include um, them in our research. So now I need to shift uh, quickly to tell you why all of this matters, why use this collaborative approach and why invest so much time and energy in trying to build um, all of these um, connections with community members. Well, Madagascar is a place uh, in which environmental change is happening at a very rapid rate today. It's being exacerbated now by an increasingly um, quickly changing climate. And this island has experienced in the last thousand years, um, you know, changes that include vegetation changes. So we're, we're seeing increasing rates of deforestation as you see on the bottom left, this is rosewood that Madagascar is very famous for, but as a, a very precious hardwood, it's being logged at uh, very rapidly and exported. Um, we see issues with erosion that, you know, are linked to uh, deforestation that I just talked about. Erosion is leading to issues of sedimentation. As you can see in the bottom right, this is a, a, an aerial view of the Betsibuka River in Western Madagascar. And you can see that red color is all the iron rich soil that is being washed into the river. And there are a lot of issues around loss of biodiversity. In the upper left hand corner, you see a lemur, which are uh, mostly endemic to Madagascar, that's being roasted over a bushfire. And that last picture calls to mind the extinction issue on Madagascar, which, you know, primarily occurred sometime in the last thousand years and involves a whole group of animals that were called the megafauna of Madagascar. Um, they included giant elephant birds, the largest birds known on the planet. Um, they included man-sized lemurs and a variety of other animals that went extinct sometime in the last thousand years. And the question has always been and continues to be, how did all of this environmental change occur? And what role did people play in these changes? Did people drive these animals to extinction by intensively hunting them? Uh, did people cause the um, changes in vegetation early on because they were building cities and, and or converting land for agriculture or for grazing their cattle? What role did people play? And the truth is that it's very complex and we don't have all of the answers. But for a long time, there has been an assumption that people are the main reason that we see these really negative changes in Madagascar's environment. Unfortunately, that assumption, even though we don't have all of the evidence we need to address the questions, that assumption leads to some very real um, impacts in terms of environmental policy, conservation policy, development policy on the island. So for example, when you look at protected areas like a marine reserve or a forest reserve on Madagascar, they are designed really to keep people, local communities out of these areas. They are not currently designed to allow um, to cooperate or collaborate with people and allow people to have some kind of access and ability to use these areas. So they're very exclusionary. It's a, it's a form of conservation um, known as fortress conservation. And this is very prevalent on Madagascar. Of course, this means if you keep people out, 
this means potentially that you're affecting the livelihoods of people who really rely on these areas, um, including people in Southwest Madagascar where we work who rely very much on the dry forest and also on um, the marine reserves for their, their livelihoods. Our idea is that by collaborating very closely with communities and incorporating their oral histories, their knowledge of the environment in all aspects of archeological research, and this is what you can see in this um, figure on the right, these are all the different kinds of stages of archaeological research that we go through from developing our questions to doing our field work to doing our analyses to producing our outputs. If we collaborate in the ways in, that I described um, earlier, then we probably will have a more complete picture of the role that people have played in shaping their environment in the past and in the present. And that if we have that complete picture, we'll have a better chance of you know, really understanding what has been happening environmentally on Madagascar, but also making sure that the kinds of policies that we develop, the approaches we, we come up with for conservation and development um, lead to more positive outcomes, both for people and the, the plants and animals um, and landscapes that, that they rely on. So we, we consider it to be an issue of environmental justice, not just an issue of kind of documenting the archeological record. And now just very quickly, because I know that I'm, I'm going over time and I promised Lindsay that I wouldn't and, I, and I've, I've uh, uh, failed, failed her. Um, I just want to give you some just quick very quick highlights of what some of the results um, have been and, and where we're heading in the future. So when we look at the plant and plant, no, animal remains primarily, this is just about the animals, the animal remains from archaeological sites on the southwest coast, we see that people were exploiting a wide range of different species, but also interestingly, that communities on the coast, even ones that were located relatively close to one another, were interacting with different groups of species. They weren't all um, exploiting the same species. So there, there was preference, depending on maybe your, your particular group's culture or um, needs, there were preferences for certain species. And this is important because there is an assumption in modern conservation work today that all communities um, who have access to wild resources like shark, which you see here, are going to exploit those resources equally, regardless. We're, we're gonna kind of be blanket consumers of the resources around us. Shark uh, are a very important example because today, they are almost completely extinct in, on the Southwest um, uh, coastline. This is really concerning and obviously, you know, has ecological implications, um, you know, throughout the ecosystem because these are top predators and they're really essential to maintaining the health of marine uh, uh, ecosystems. But when we look at the archaeological record and the results that we have so far, we actually see that shark were not uh, hunted until the very, very recent past. And the assumption had always been in the conservation science community that people have been harvesting shark for a long time. And so the, the trend that we see today is part of a much longer trend. But actually, we're showing through our archaeological work and collaborations with oral historians who can tell us about uh, fishing practices within, within their memories. We're documenting that shark hunting is a very recent phenomenon um, and that the rate at which shark have disappeared is extremely rapid. It's happened within the last few decades, which is also a significant finding.
there's a lot that I can say about mobility, but to make it very brief, the communities that we work with are all nomadic or semi-nomadic. We're using archeological research and oral historical research to understand why people have um, lived nomadically, why they've moved so much around the landscape, and whether that's an important strategy for them to be able to live in an environment that has such a harsh and unpredictable climate. This is important because once again, there's a lot of development policy that's trying to keep people sedentary, trying to keep people in the same spot. So for example, with a marine reserve, trying to make sure that they can monitor use of the marine reserve and access to resources around the reserve is easier if people all stay in the same spot. It's harder if you, you're dealing with nomadic communities. Um, so a lot of the efforts have been to kind of get people to stay put. But what we're trying to demonstrate through our archaeological research is that mobility might be a really key strategy um, that, that we shouldn't limit um, because it allows people more flexibility on this landscape. Um, uh, finally, you know, we've learned through oral historical interviews about all kinds of hidden parts of the landscape that are really important. So on the right hand side here, you're looking at a map um, that was made in the 1950s um, uh, during the French colonial um, administration that doesn't have a lot of really important information on it. For one thing, it doesn't have any major cave systems recorded on it. And this is because local communities um, who were informing map makers, government map makers, uh, were not sharing the locations of these important sites because they were, they were used as hiding places and other places of refuge um, during periods of political turmoil. Um, so again, by collaborating, we're starting to see a lot more of how this landscape was used. We're very proud that when community members talk about the archaeological work that we're doing, um, they say that the soil does not lie. And this, is direct, this is a way of talking about the value of the archaeological research and a way also of showing that they don't view the work that we're doing as a conflict with their uh, oral histories and their understanding of the landscape. It's become a complement, and we're very proud of that. And this is a picture of our team excavating at one of these sites. The work that we've done, um, the collaborative approach that we've taken was recently featured in an article uh, in Nature Magazine about inclusive science, and we really hope that the work that we do can serve as an example, as a model for other research groups to engage in more inclusive um, research practices. I hope that um, what I've shared with you today has um, you know, given you some food for thought in terms of what archaeology can look like in different parts of the world. I just want to end by saying that there's no one size fits all for collaborative research. This is one example, um, but it's one that I think has, um, uh, you know, demonstrated the importance of, of working with communities um, uh, to do this kind of research and that it has real life implications for people who are alive today. So I'll end there and just open it up um, for questions if there are any questions. And sorry, Lindsay, to have gone so far over. No, it's completely fine. It was really good. Um, I would just like to start off with one of my questions while some of the questions come in. Um, what got you interested in Madagascar? Um, That's a great question. I grew up in Madagascar in part. Um, I, you know, I grew up in a family of um, uh, expats, so we moved around quite a bit but we spent about 10 years in the central highlands of Madagascar, which are, well, on this map, are located right around here in the capital city of Antananarivo. And my parents worked in uh, foreign aid and public health, uh, different kinds of projects. And so I was exposed very early on to some of the 
uh, challenges that Madagascar is experiencing today in terms of conservation, education, public health, economic development. I'm always fascinated by the, um, the ecology of Madagascar. As many people are probably aware, Madagascar has so many um, species that are only found on Madagascar, nowhere else in the world. Uh, but also has all of these challenges relating to um, losing biodiversity. Um, and so as an island, it's a really important place to understand, um, you know, both how we get that kind of biodiversity, um, but also, you know, how, what kinds of things can, uh, can impact it. So I was always very interested in that. And, and when I had the opportunity to pick a project as a PhD student, I, I was really excited to be able to work um, on Madagascar. Good, well, thank you. Sorry, I have my kid in the background. Hold on. Okay, sorry, there was an accident, everyone. It's okay, we're all good. Um, uh, let me see, so hold on, I got a question. Um, so from Suana Crowley, she mentioned, you mentioned the inclusion of your team members in all aspects of the research, and have you had any of those people continuing such work past maybe working with you? That's a wonderful question. Most of the team still works together at various um, times. So because many of the team members are, you know, nomadic or semi-nomadic, Depending on when we're working, um, not everybody might be available to work on this particular project um, so that the, the group changes from year to year a little bit, but many of the same people continue to work with us. Um, some of the people on the team through our uh, fundraising efforts have gone on to um, complete either um, high school, so secondary school, or even have started university studies and um, intend um, to complete that as soon as possible. There are a lot of challenges, again, linked to funding and linked to um, uh, you know, school closures and, and various things, but intend to then go on to careers, um, either working in conservation, which is probably the more um, likely because that's where there are more jobs available. Um, but one of our uh, pipe dreams at this stage is to to create a um, a company that would be owned and, and managed by members of the the Malagasy team that could do archaeological survey work um, and reconnaissance work for development. You know, in in the U.S. and in many countries, there is cultural resource management where there are companies who go out and document archaeological sites. Um, before a major development project like building a road or a pipeline or something like that. That's not really the case for Madagascar, but this certainly um, uh, should be the case. And uh, many members of the team are interested in creating that kind of company in the future. So we have a lot of, um, you know, future, future plans, um, but these are, th these are things that I keep reminding myself are going to take time to to uh, now do people like throw elbows trying to join your team and everything <laughs> that's a great question you know that it's it's a struggle because we work in a community where livelihoods are are challenging especially given that the fishery um, is collapsing and um, climate change is causing all of these other um, really big challenges so jobs are limited and when people have an opportunity to take a job um, and hopefully you know we do a, a pretty good job of paying people a fair uh, fair wage um, you know yeah a lot of people want that opportunity so we we do our best um, to work with community elders also to make sure that they're part of our recruitment process and so that they can have a say and how equitably we're hiring across the community to try to make sure that we spread spread opportunity around as much as possible. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, so the last question is how receptive um, has the sort of um, political aspect of Madagascar, of the sort of political entity in the conservation stuff, or have you not begun using your research to 
maybe help them better understand how to work on those reserves or maybe, you know, keeping everyone in one place isn't the right way? Well, at this stage in our research, um, what we've tried to do is maintain very open dialogue with people who are working in conservation and with people who work in various ministries about what we're doing and what we're finding. Um, and, you know, we've been working in this area for 10 years, but um, it takes a long time, I think, to build up the kinds of, um, you know, data sets that, that, that are- trust. Well, that, and also because this landscape is so, um, um, what's the way to describe this? People have moved around this landscape so much. It's really difficult, for example, to find one archeological site that, show, that shows uh, a continuous use through time to be able to really see changes through time. So by that, I mean a place that people settled and, and stayed, um, stayed in for, you know, 500 years or a thousand years, you know, something like that. A lot of the sites that we study were occupied for a really short period of time. So they're like a brief snapshot. Um, and we're trying to do a better job now of dating all of the sites that we uh, study so that we have a, a higher resolution understanding of these sites. Um, so th there's basically the answer is there's a lot of work to be done and we're kind of still at the beginnings, but we are um, talking, consistently talking with people who work in conservation and sharing our results. And also um, they have been wonderful and gracious about sharing data that they have about what people are um, doing in the fishery and all of that. So we have open relationships and my hope is that we can do more um, not just sharing of our, our, our separate work, but now in the future start to work on things jointly. That is so cool. Um, well, I won't keep anyone else more for more time, but thank you, Dr. Douglas. This was so fascinating. I am so happy you were able to uh, talk to, with us today and I'm so happy that all of the participants were able to call in um, again, this will, this recording will be on our YouTube, uh, pages for the Peabody and for the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And, um, join us in two weeks for Dr. Kate Johnson, who will be talking about, uh, LIDAR and the landscapes through archaeology. So thank you again, Dr. Douglas. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Bye.